Without a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, enjoying other rights, such as life, food, health, water, and development, becomes a challenge. Knowledge and awareness on the link between the environment and human rights remains low, with limited processes and tools to share any knowledge that is available. To overcome this, all parties, government, private, and the community must be involved in awareness raising and knowledge sharing activities. Innovative research, as well as communicating and implementing research findings, is also a priority. Finally, tools and trainings must be developed and used to ensure there is awareness of the link between human rights and the environment across all parts of society. Increased understanding of this intrinsic link can result in a better natural environment and stronger human rights for those who live within it. Human rights within Environment-Related Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are challenged by a gap between commitment from national governments and SDG implementation at the community level. How do we promote diversity and inclusion of all people to implement SDGs that aim to fulfill their rights? How do we ensure that national government commitment to human rights can be experienced at the local level? And how can we ensure that community efforts are supported, not restricted, by national governments? We can provide blended learning and training models on localizing human rights and environment for SDG activities. We can develop and use practical tools to support analysis, participation, and monitoring of SDG implementation. And we can support research, partnerships, and networking for all parties who are interested in human rights and environmental SDGs. These efforts work to achieve the realization of human rights for communities as a result of implementing environmental SDGs at a local level. Natural disaster and climate change continue to displace people across the Asia and Pacific region, resulting in significant impacts on their human rights. How do we ensure that people's basic rights, such as life, health and education, can be fulfilled after a disaster or climate change event? How do we support the rights of people who are on the move after disaster? And how do we guarantee the human rights of those who live in new and foreign places? We can engage and empower communities to develop their own disaster risk reduction strategies. We can ensure disaster management stakeholders better understand human rights approaches in relation to disaster and climate change. And we can strengthen networking and knowledge sharing using practical tools, applying research outcomes and providing training to support human rights efforts in disaster management. This ensures that the human rights of displaced people are always considered within disaster risk reduction and climate change activities throughout the region. Okay. Hi. Hello again, everyone. My name is Nana. Thank you for joining us in the last uh, 
session uh, for today. Uh, we have this networking session titled Opportunities and Challenges in Regional Collaboration. Um, this is the last session uh, of the journalism conference on reporting human rights and climate crisis in Southeast Asia. Uh, this event is presented by a partnership of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute along with Indonesian Association for Media Development and Internews Earth Journalism Network. Uh, early, and earlier today, we had a session titled Data Journalism on Regional Environment and Climate Crisis Stories, and we have learned so much from the speaker, so I hope that uh, we can learn a lot from this session too. I would uh, like to inform you that we have a interpretation feature in Bahasa Indonesia for the participants, and there's also a live stream on YouTube going on right now. You can go to YouTube and search PPMN. Right, so today we have joined by Florence Armain, the moderator of this session. Uh, hi, Florence. So before I give the session to you, let me introduce you first. Florence is the Indonesia Content Coordinator in EJN and was the head of Jakarta Globe News Channel. Uh, it's a part of Berita Satu Holdings and she was in charge for a team comprised of executive producers, translators, copy editors, video editors, and master control room personnel. And before joining the Jakarta Globe News Channel, she was the deputy head for Brita Sato English. So to Florence, welcome and good luck. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nana. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the networking session, call it, or so happens to be the last session of the journalism conference on reporting climate crisis and human rights. And as Nana has said, this is a partnership between uh, PPMN, Internews Earth Journalism Network or AGN, and also the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Thank you so much for your time here for the participants. We appreciate, we appreciate you spending some time um, saying hi and, and building your network. So yes, I'm Florence Armain, uh, content coordinator for AGN. Now for those, those of you, this is a, a bit of a shameless plug. For those of you who are not aware of uh, what AGN is, it's a, it's a global um, community or, or a network, if you will, of um, environmental journalists across 180 countries. And at the same time, we are an implementer of media development activities through which we hope uh, to be able to empower journalists in developing countries to better report uh, the environment. So please visit us on uh, earthjournalism.net to get to know us, become part of the global network and see what all the other works that we do. Now, uh, coming back to the session, I think um, it's, safe, it's safe to say that everyone here know know for a fact that collaboration is not a new thing. So uh, between 1984, when five newspapers in New York got together to form Associated Press to the Pandora Papers this year, we had the 2016 Panama Papers, Gecko Project, uh, Pangolin Trafficking Project. Um, we all have become, have seen, all have become part of a collaboration. But um, we have seen how journalism improved with collaboration. We have seen how we've seen more impactful and meaningful stories through collaboration. But um, uh, but the pandemic, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has made collaboration between um, news actors and non-news uh, actors become more important. So today we will hear the speakers about uh, regional collaboration, its challenges, um, opportunities. And since this is a networking session, we do wanna hear from you. Uh, drop us a note on the chat box. And if you have questions later on, we want to see lo loads of questions for the speakers. Please raise, uh, use the raise hand um, function and then we'll unmute you. So the speakers, let me get, we have four interesting speakers today. Let me get to the first one, Sam. He is the um, uh, editor for special project for AJN. So before AJN, he was a full-time freelance journalist and editor as well as an adjunct professor. He has a PhD in environmental science and his work has been featured on NPR, Manga Bay, Dosha Verla Radio, among others. And Sam is also a Pulitzer Reign Forest Journalism recipi recipient for the period of 2020 and 21, based in the US. And then we will hear from Lulu, who's in Brussels at the moment, uh, or been several, for several years. Uh, Lulu is an award-winning journalist and editor. Um, she's currently leading the international news desk of Initia Media, 
based in Hong Kong, a media platform focusing on independent and in-depth reporting. And since 2016, she has focused more on China's various connections with international community, um, with attention on politics, economy, and, and the environment. And then from Hong Kong, we will move to Vietnam, where we'll hear from Michael, uh, who is the editor-in-chief for Saigon News. And he's based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and he covers environment, energy, wildlife conservation, and social issues, among others. And his work has been published by outlets, including the Washington Post, The Atlantic, um, Al Jazeera, and Southeast Asia Globe. And then from Vietnam, we'll come back to Indonesia, where we will hear from Viria, who is a reporter at Project Multatuli, an Indonesian public service journalism initiative, and one of the latest edition in, in, Indian, in Indonesia's um, thriving uh, digital media scene. And he previously worked with Bloomberg News and Jakarta Post uh, covering uh, various beats, including energy and mining, mac uh, macroeconomics and politics. And in 2015, he actually uh, published a book uh, called Cramming Jakarta, the center and periphery in a collection of reportage. So uh, we'll be hearing from all of them, but to kick us off uh, right now, um, I'll hand over you Sam to talk a little bit about um, the special project he's working on with, with, with these journalists um, and how this, this project, uh, this collaboration came about. Over to you, Sam. Great, thank you so much, Florence, and, and thank you so much to the organizers, to the organizers of this conference that is, uh, incredibly important uh, subject. In fact, it's really two incredibly important subjects, um, the climate crisis and human rights. And of course, we all know that they intersect, um, but uh, it's it's much needed this this opportunity um, to network with journalists in the field um, and on this matter and, and frankly, all uh, environmental related um, issues going forward because I think they do have both those pegs, a human rights um, and a global environmental change peg. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here, and I have a brief presentation, uh, and I, I've kindly requested that Florence move me along a little bit because I have a tendency to be long-winded. So I'm going to try to get through this uh, in a relatively rapid clip. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay. So we all are quite familiar with the idea that we live in a globalized world this is nothing new and the COVID-19 pandemic has really crystallized this uh perhaps more so than we ever thought possible uh we're all deeply interconnected both in our virtual platforms um and uh and and frankly in just in our interpersonal communication right from whatsapp which billions of people around the world now use to other uh apps as well uh on sort of, we're all sort of in a state of synchronicity uh, and in constant communication. But this sort of coincides globally. And I know there, this is quite different depending on your geography, where, where you live and work. But we can generally say with some level of certainty that the media environment around the world is pretty fragmented, right? Um, this has come at the consequence of legacy media, whether in the form of large newspapers or um, network uh, television and radio, um, and obviously corporate consolidation um, has in some ways diminished in many parts of the world um, as, as it relates to media. And that has also brought with it a, a, a different sense of um, transition and, and changing times. So we have these two things that are sort of coinciding with each other, this idea of interconnectivity and synchronicity around the world between people, between um, outlets and people, between uh, journalists and the audiences they reach, and of course, um, this fragmentation that um, that occurs and is occurring uh, in the media environment as a whole, and not just in environmental journalism or, or human rights related journalism, but um, journalism at large. So just to give you a brief, um, I guess you could say data points in this regard, just in the past couple of years, these are sorts of things that have also kind of been in the picture. And these are across the board internationally, both for um, journalists in the global north and the global south, 
so there's vanishing advertising revenue and changing habits of news consumption on the internet, social media, we all know. And perhaps you may work with uh, forms of uh, news media in which social media is not only your preferred outlet, but is your outlet and is your uh, medium for transmitting information, right? So we have this uh, new innovation. At the same time, we also have data that increasingly, uh, I suppose you could say, some uh, tragic data, uh, depressing that most journals are not in the struggle to survive past their second year. This is, um, again, across the board from the Foreign Press Association this year, published this year. Um, and then we also have a sense from our consumers, that is our readers, our viewers, um, uh, our listeners, um, that the majority, again, this is at, at a global scale of respondents, have a negative impression of the news media. So sorry to give you this, <laughs> the dire news. It doesn't necessarily go up better, but it's interesting with regards to the journalists, not necessarily the, the media environment as a whole. 94% um, of journalists say that most of all the reporting has pivoted to COVID-19 issues in the past year. That makes sense, right? We're still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and at the same time, while well, there's been this incredible push towards COVID-related news, 19% of journalists, again, at a global scale, so they have less work in general. Um, and then some 23%, you can't see that very well, so they have a larger workload due to layoffs and furloughs of others. Uh, the average journalist, again, globally, has three or more beats. The average journalist works on five stories a week, only a quarter of which comes from pitches. And then you can come to somebody like myself, who is past yes, serve as an editor, uh, and we work on more than and five stories a day. And I think this is probably an undercount for many of you who, who work on dailies um, or sort of more um, on, a, on a daily type, daily schedule for, for your outlets. But again, from the editor's perspective, it's also not necessarily um, a lot easier. Into this enters uh, innovation, though. And I, this is from the Neiman Lab. And I, some of you are quite familiar with the Neiman Lab, the Neiman Center uh, in Journalism. Yeah, based, based where I'm in the U.S. And they, every year, do sort of, uh, I guess you could say, um, uh, somewhat, somewhat crazy predictions about the year to come. Um, and this was in 2021, the predictions for journals in 2021 that COVID-19 would prepare us for cross-border collaboration. This is sort of done in December of, of 2020 that this uh, prediction was made. This year, the same Neiman Lab predictions for journalism uh, written in, in December 2021 for the year 2022. Again, cross-border, these are one of many uh, ideas about innovations to come, but again, cross-border collaborations become easier and more balanced. So we've gone from, this is going to be a thing as a result of the pandemic to this is now has arrived and this may be the way of the future, if not um, the status quo for the moment. And, um, Wilson Levano, who has quoted, is quoted here saying, by working alongside local journalists as equal partners, not as assistants or fixers, newsrooms can finally put the rest of the practice of parachute journalism and build long-term beneficial relationships. So Florence already kind of stole my thunder a little bit about mentioning <laughs> collaboration in the past. Um, um, but I'm glad she did because it, it sort of alludes to the many different efforts that um, most of you are probably pretty familiar with. Uh, collaboration that is taking place. So there's Pegasus Project, which included 80 reporters, 17 media houses, um, which revealed, uh, you know, the, the, the malware um, that an Israeli firm was uh, implanting in uh, cell phones and uh, other devices across the world, particularly in, in political leaders and um, and other, other individuals. There is, of course, the Pandora Papers, which Flo also mentioned, include 280 journalists with over 100 outlets. Tempo, I don't know if anybody's from Tempo is in the room. Tempo was involved and a couple um, of Ind Indonesian ministers were implicated in this uh, particular series of investigations that again was sort of convened, it was, it was convened in this case by a nonprofit much like ourselves. I mean, not to say that the ICIJ is um, exactly like ourselves, but it is a nonprofit, it is an NGO. Uh, much like the Press Journalism Network is, that was the convener for the project. And before that, as Flo also mentioned, the Panama Papers, which uh, was sort of the precursor to the Pandora Papers in, in terms of revealing offshore financial industry. Uh, 
So these are all examples of collaborative journalism, but what exactly is collaboration? Um, you probably find across the internet in, in sort of divergent opinion upon this, but we kind of define collaborative journalism and by we, uh, I'm taking from the collaborative journalism.org, which is the center and university in, in, here in the United States and in the state of New Jersey, um, as a cooperative arrangement, formal and informal, between two or more news organizations and information organizations, which aims to supplement each organization's resources and maximize the impact of the content produced. So that's really important. It's sort of mutually beneficial and not butting heads like these two goats here. And I believe this is actually taken in Western Java. Uh, Garuk sheep. Um, we're not, we're hopefully not like that. So from Montclair State University, you can see here uh, different models of collaborativism. And I highly encourage you if you have the opportunity to check this uh, site out and has a storehouse of information that I think is quite interesting for all of you who are interested in collaborations and the prospect for collaborative journalism. But it sort of gives you a typology, kind of gives you a way of putting together what you might wish to have in a, in a collaborative uh, project. So if you're looking for something that's one time or finite um, versus something that's ongoing or open-ended, there's just a different things to keep in mind. Um, in our particular case for the fossil fuel project, which I'll get into shortly, I would say that we sort of fit between this, sort of the straddle, um, the area between temporary and separate and temporary and co-creating. And, and what I mean by that is that we, this is a temporary project, which we'll talk about, but um, it wasn't necessarily extremely separate between all the partners like Lulu and, and Michael. Um, and yet at times it wasn't necessarily a mutual co-creating uh, enterprise um, along the lines of, for instance, the Pandora Papers or the Pegasus Project, um, which is a whole different level of, of coordination. And, and we'll also talk about that hopefully. And so in this way, you can sort of see here what that would look like um, and, and the potential uh, issues that you encounter, sort of conflicting priorities that you might have um, between different outlets that are involved, uh, potentially tensions of editorial styles that are a result of, for instance, um, different work cultures, different languages, different types of outlets that may be involved in your project. So this is the, the co-creating example I'm using here, which is the one I think we must um, closely align with. Although again, we straddle the co-creating and the, and the temporary and separate model. And, uh, and so there's a variety of solutions to deal with these, um, but at the end result, these types of collaborations are good for investigative and accountability stories, time sensitive projects requiring multiple resources and leveraging the unique skills uh, of a newsroom. Um, that you may lack, which in our case um, is absolutely essential because EJN is not um, an outlet um, that has its own uh, organ, right? News organ. So the project itself, the fossil fuel project, uh, it was really focused on one simple premise. Why is fossil fuel investment continuing in Asia, both foreign and domestic, when climate change and human rights, the, the top of this conference, Concerns surrounding these energy sources dictate countries should be doing otherwise. It's as simple as that. It was really the operating question that sort of organized um, all of our stories and, and the content. Um, the project started in May of this year with a concept note that was shared uh, amongst many of our uh, eventual collaborators. And we started soliciting potential partners by June throughout South and Southeast Asia, including leverage partnerships, which for many of our content coordinators had, including, uh, for instance, Florence, um, but not exclusively, and, uh, and others with, with whom we did not necessarily have an established relationship. There were more stops, and we can probably talk about that in a little more detail in the Q and A. But um, these are all these are sort of, sort of along the lines of what I mentioned before, to be expected given um, sort of conflicting, not necessarily conflicting, but differences in the types of outlets, the types of stories that each outlet produces, language, culture in some cases from time zone, um, priorities of daily versus a weekly versus in some cases, uh, very periodic uh, distribution for an outlet. But at the end of the day, by, by the end of August, we had our first stories and we were initially hoping to wrap up by October prior to COP26, <laughs> but, um, but as often is the case with guidelines and many of you are familiar, 
uh, we've had to move those um, in, in large part because the quality of our stories uh, required us to give um, more space to the journalists working on them and our collaborators in order to have sort of a, a, a really um, uh, robust uh, ending to, to close out of this project, which we will have um, by, um, by the beginning of next year, 2022. And in the end, we had six outlets and the 15 journalists participating. So punching far above our weight, not necessarily the Pandora Papers or the Pegasus Project, but um, six outlets and 15 journalists for EJN is, is quite noble. Here is a website for the project if you have an opportunity to visit it. Um, it's called Available But Not Needed, a special project on fossil fuel investment in Asia. If, uh, if you're wondering about the title, that actually comes from an energy investment term, uh, ironically enough, not necessarily about in, in a positive light, but um, it is, it, it's an investment term that refers specifically in petroleum markets. Um, and uh, we sort of appropriated it for the purposes of our project, somewhat tongue in cheek. You can see here uh, where the distribution of our stories and our outlets um, uh, have been thus far. This will be further populated uh, in the next month. But uh, again, the concentration on Southeast Asia with stories from China, including uh, and South Korea, with in many cases a link between those countries that are not necessarily in Southeast Asia and their investment patterns in Southeast Asia, including in many, in many cases Indonesia, which most of the uh, participants in this conference are from, I know. Here are the examples, the, the thumbnails of the stories we have thus far. Um, and uh, you can see the sort of distribution of those and, uh, and the types of types that I described. And again, I encourage you to, I highly encourage you to visit the site for more details and please um, peruse the stories. So the lessons learned I would say from this, in my uh, sort of brief uh, bird's eye view of this process, much like the Indonesian uh, uh, quote here from um, the scholar, the famed education scholar, Ki Hajar Adewantara, make a teacher out of everyone in a school out of every place. And it's sort of been an educational process I think for all of us involved. Um, in terms of the question, what are you trying to accomplish? That's really important, I think, essential from all forms of collaboration. Um, and uh, that needs to be really well thought out in the beginning. Um, you also need to think about what unifies your collaborative journalistic project. In many cases for collaborative journalism, it starts around a data set, as in the case of uh, the Pandora Papers or the Pegasus Project or the Panama Papers or any of these large scale collaborative projects. They usually start around um, a specific set of data or leaked um, files. Um, and in, in the absence of that, what do you have that is the unifying um, feature? And uh, so you need to think about that quite um, thoroughly. How do you intend to work with different work cultures, personalities at different outlets? And then of course, even beyond that, journalist, journalists in those different outlets. <clears throat> and then <coughs> I think this is one of these overlooked questions is how do you make collaboration sustainable? So once you've achieved it, in our case, uh, <coughs> Internews is an NGO, uh, Earth Journalism Network is a program within Internews, and um, we uh, are grant funded. And um, so that is our funding stream, that is our revenue source. Um, and so to a degree, we can uh, subsist off of those funds in pursuit of these collaborative efforts. But if you're an outlet, that wishes to start your own um, collaborative exploit, um, what, what is the sustainable model that you have for achieving that? And it's not necessarily an easy question, but it's certainly one that needs to be asked from, from the beginning and um, with, with a lot of, in, in a very sober manner. And then ultimately, how do you wrap things up? So you've had this incredible project, you may have an incredible uh, data set, or you may have an incredible question, but um, at the end of the day, all things have um, a deadline. Um, and how do you wrap up um, your project in a way that is uh, fulfilling, um, but also understanding that it may lead to further collaborations or it may not, but, uh, but it's important to, to keep that in mind that it should have some sort of terminus. And how do you determine that? And, and, and um, how do you make it count when you do wrap things up? <laughs> So with that, I, I think I spoke over my time. I apologize, but um, I just want to thank again uh, the conference organizers. Um, and my contact information is here in the event you wish to get in touch with me. 
Um, and I'll give it back to you, I'll give the floor back to Flo. Thank you, Sam. I think you're right on time. Um, good timing there. And, and thank you for... That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first for everything. And thank you for quoting a national hero from Indonesia. And, and indeed, that is actually one of uh, the most quoted uh, um, uh, expression um, when it comes to trying to uh, get everyone to understand what it means, what education means here in the country. Thanks for thanks for the relevant uh, quote there, and uh, we'll we'll get we'll circle circle back to you. Uh, there are a couple of questions that we'd like to ask uh, ask you as well, but uh, we'd like to hear from Lulu right now, who's uh, from Initia Media. Lulu will be talking a little bit about her work with uh, the Fossil Fuel Project. And um, we'll hear from Lulu about that work. We'll hear from the challenges that she uh, faced uh, during her work with uh, the project. So Lulu, if you are ready. Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. And thanks, Sam, for this very thorough and interesting introduction to our project. I will um, briefly introduce a little bit of how Initial Media and myself participated in this collaboration. So um, briefly, Initial Media, uh, now based in Singapore, we are a behind the paywall, long form writing kind of newsroom. We are very small, we have very little resources. <laughs> Bear in mind of the um, reality of our newsroom, which will explain um, choices we made and how this project, what this project means to us. So we entered this project with a um, series of three stories. Um, we call it uh, Future of uh, Co-Exit with a question mark, focusing on China's um, situation in the uh, global package picture. Basically also um, within the frame where China pledged a quite ambitious carbon reduction uh, in the recent years. So we have three pieces of uh, in-depth reporting stories, collaborating with journalists in-house from Initium in mainland China, as well as um, freelancing journalists in Indonesia. So one of our story focuses on um, two uh, co-production city, a very big, co-production co city in China, in um, Shanxi province. We want to look at the human side of the story where what happened to people living in a traditionally co-dependent um, city, how their life has been affected or not um, by the new um, pledge by the government, which we go into the details of the history of what co means to this economy, what people's life and generations and environment has been affected by it. And the second piece is a rather ambitious policy and data analysis of the overall picture of what does coal mean to China? Where are we now with sustainable energy transactions? Where is gas? What does it mean to our economy or to, to our life, etc.? And finally, the third piece is going to look into China's investment in Indonesia in terms of a coal um, plantation, which has been a trend that we, uh, for us who are looking at China's obviously investment, it's been quite a remarkable trend of uh, a large amount of investment, but we are asking if that has changed, what happens to any of this investment if it didn't work out? What kind of loss and uh, um, risk different stakeholders are taking there and what is the more complicated local electrical and energy situation. So as you can see, these are three very ambitious um, uh, pitches. And um, to be honest, some of these have been circulated within our newsroom. We, are having, we have been talking about it, brainstorming whether we are able to do it um, before this, this special project happened. As a small newsroom, there will be hesitations if you guys um, probably face similar challenges where uh, environment and climate change are not necessarily the most sexy and most interesting um, stories for your audience. And as if you're small on headcounts and um, ambitious also to the quality of the uh, end result, then there will always be a little bit of like, do we, how do we approach this sector? Um, who and for how long 
of a, a period can we invest on it um, um, in, within, you know, for the for this year or for coming years. So um, we're very lucky that this uh, collaboration happens, that we are able to um, pull some resources from the um, Internews um, grant so that we're able to nail it down in a way like we this journalist, we're going to do this, you're going to do that, and I will be able to coordinate all these stories together. Within this project, I'm more of a um, uh, coordinating editor's role. I'm sitting in Brussels and I'm working with different journalists uh, um, to, to make it happen. What's very interesting is also as we finally like were able to say like, we're gonna do it, let's do it. Um, a series of news came out uh, after we're already working on it. For instance, uh, China says that you will not no longer invest in new overseas coal power plant. Uh, that's the news um, somewhere later this year. And um, there's also inside China, there's a really a um, sudden but very heated debate about electricity use because there was suddenly a restriction of electricity uses for ordinary people's life because before it was um, mostly felt in the industries, in factories, but suddenly it was more touched by um, a, every, our average audience. So. In a way, we were, um, how do I put it? So it's a, as a journalist working on long pieces, you always find you're very lucky in a way that uh, people are paying attention to what you're already working on. So that in the end, our um, timing for publication and our, uh, the, the debate and the comments and the readership we are generating around our three very um, ambitious pieces, two are already published. The Indonesian article is still upcoming. It's, um, it's, it's, it's different and it's a um, almost a privilege and also a, a, a luck, I guess, to, to be able to already um, put in time and resources. And that's also another beautiful uh, factor, I think, from this kind of collaboration, because you're gonna always ask a more of a million dollar question. You're gonna ask for something that's not about the news today and eventually it's going to be news tomorrow. And I think that's what we, um, learned from this um, project. So, um, well, yeah, in the end, we were able to dive into a very complicated picture. Uh, we were able to tell details of generations of stories from a coal city in China. We were able to dive into a very complicated set of data and it was well received by our audience. So we were very lucky in that sense. Doesn't come out without challenges. Um, as I said, this is, uh, I'm sitting this is a really cross-border collaborations within, um, yeah, it's in 2021 where COVID is still, still restricting a lot of traveling possibilities, but we were able to pull a lot of stories out from ground reporting um, trips. We were able to go to the cities. We were able to visit, we were able to visit in the um, power plant in Indonesia that was eventually canceled and now left just with a piece of land that promised necessary electricity to the island, but it was not uh, realized, what does it mean? All these, um, what Sam just talked about is temporary, um, but uh, uh, wait, what was the word, the category of your uh, 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 collaborations? I think what we are doing in, in, in this is like, it's okay. Yeah. Well, there's temporary yeah. separate, and then there's temporary and co-creating. Yes, I think if we are three of uh, the three stories initially we're producing within a pro project is somewhere sit with, like under the bigger umbrella, it's a smaller version. Uh, because it is also, even though it is um, all initial production, still we're working with different, I'm working with different journalists. Um, like, uh, yeah, like the challenges Sam talked about, I felt the same. Um, because it's very different from the kind of collaboration projects I used to work where I'm on the ground with our partners and we're very closely, very, uh, works very closely together for a period of time. This time it's uh, three pieces of really long stories that we it probably worked on over more than half a year now. So um, yeah, a lot of challenges of communication, of making sure the deadlines are met, but also about how are these stories made from a distance? How can I, for instance, sitting on my desk, um, making sure the facts are right, the interviews, the angles, the stories, the narratives, and kind of communication with journalists on the ground is very essential and um, doesn't always come without challenges. Um, I think that's my time. I, yeah, uh, Florence, does this answer your questions? 
Yep, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll circle back to you, Ron. It's interesting because you're also wearing two hats in in some in some of the collaborations that see you've done. You're not only the reporting, but you're also the editor of that collaboration. We'll come back to you on 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 that. And now from and and also uh, it's actually Singapore based, it's not Hong Kong based. So I stand corrected on where Initial Media was. And moving on from uh, Lulu, we will hear from uh, Michael, who is the editor in chief for Saigoners. Uh, very very happy to have you here, Michael. And yes, same goes to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your story um, and what have been the challenges uh, in context of this uh, collaboration? Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks, uh, Sam, for kind of laying the background. And Lulu, really interesting to hear about your work and what you did with this as well. Um, so yeah, just briefly, kind of a little bit about myself. I mean, as mentioned, uh, Editor-in-Chief at Saigoneer, uh, Culture and um, society, history, food website based here in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, although I didn't do this for second year, uh, this is a bit newsy, um, which second year kind of avoids for a variety of reasons. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with Vietnam, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so when Sam approached me about this project, I was immediately in interested. I've done a, a fair amount of reporting on Vietnam energy policy, uh, renewables, Fossil fuel, obviously a lot of focus here on the project um, and decided I wanted to work or try to focus on um, LNG, so liquid natural gas, which there's been quite a lot of discussion about in Vietnam recently, but very little um, sort of real coverage. And, you know, in domestic media, you'd see a lot of kind of announcements of um, Exxon or, you know, some American corporation announcing a $2 billion deal or something like that, but then not much about what that means for energy infrastructure or what will actually happen. Um, and one thing I will say, this is my first time working on a project like this. And even though I ended up working on the story uh, by myself, like the actual reporting of it, um, I mean, obviously, you know, liaised a lot with Sam in the editing and planning process, which was really helpful. Um, but it was, in, it was cool to have this space to work in of all these different topics being worked on by other reporters around the region and around Asia um, or around the world in, in Sam's case, um, kind of having the space to work on something um, with a specific aim, a specific topic, uh, although there's a lot of different, you know, a lot of room within that topic. Um, and yeah, I, you know, again, I didn't directly collaborate with somebody in, in the reporting, but I did talk to other reporters on the project about other, what they were doing. Um, for example, I talked to Silky Lee, who uh, she's not here, but she also wrote a story related to Vietnam and is based in South Korea. So we talked about, you know, what she was looking at, whether I might have any tips. So she was more focused on coal investment, which is a little different than what I was looking at. Um, so overall, I was really happy with how things went. And, you know, there's a lot of pros to being involved in a collaborative, you know, transnational uh, project like this. Um, some of the challenges were kind of more related to just being in Vietnam or, or the timing. Um, I mean, we've obviously talked about COVID already. And um, I, for something like this, I would usually want to do some field reporting. Um, and that was not possible. Uh, for most of you probably know, but Vietnam started going through a really severe COVID outbreak in late April and into May, and then really, really got bad through June, July, August. Um, so domestic travel was Pretty much impossible or at least really risky so you know it was all desk reporting which was a little bit frustrating but at the same time um i mean one of the parts of the story was that there's been all this talk about lng investment in vietnam but nothing has actually been built there's no terminals there's no power plants there's nothing like that so in reality it would have actually been a little bit tricky for me to do field reporting because there was uh, nothing to go look at i couldn't go take pictures of a power plant or storage tanks or anything along those lines um, but just knowing that field reporting wasn't even an option was uh, a little frustrating, especially when there's you're working on a project where, you know, theoretically that's in the budget as well. Um, so again, desk reporting, which is not the best. Um, I mean, another challenge, again, this comes with being in Vietnam is there's no access to policymakers or government. So I can, you know, talk to the, the Ministry of Industry about their energy policy or what their expectations are for LNG or why they're kind of um, accept, you know, accepting investment in it when we're starting to see that environmentally, it's 
perhaps not you know in the same level as coal, but there are pretty major concerns around methane emissions and leakage um, that are getting becoming more prominent and will probably only become more prominent in the future if LNG you know use continues to expand. Um, so that's a frustration, just not getting that official. And I mean, maybe they, you know, maybe there are good reasons to use LNG. I don't want to rule it out entirely, but you can't ask those questions of the government. So it's relying on people in the private sector, um, researchers, academics who were all fantastic. Um, I was really happy with who I was able to find and talk to, but that's unfortunately part and parcel of reporting uh, in Vietnam. Um, but as a project, I found this to be really rewarding. Um, it's been Fantastic to see, you know, the other stories that have popped up um, and, you know, across a wide range of topics and countries. And it's really interesting to see, you know, Vietnam in a place like Indonesia or, you know, vastly different countries, but face many of the same challenges when it comes to, you know, powering a fast growing populous nation um, in the context of climate change. But, you know, both all these all the countries around Southeast Asia and, and I mean, the world, of course, will be you know, deeply impacted by climate change in the coming decades. So kind of looking at what's happening in other countries and recognizing some of the similar policy challenges or things that people are going to going through um, issues facing local communities. Um, so I think kind of giving that wider perspective um, is another pro of working on something like this. And then of course, for readers, hopefully they also get that kind of big picture perspective that uh, you really miss when, as Sam was talking about in his intro, you know, if publication or writers, if you're working on five stories a week, like you don't really get that, that big picture. You're, that's through no fault of their own. They're just kind of focused on what's right in front of them, um, which is a bit of a disservice to both the journalists working on it and the, the readers ultimately. So I think for me, probably the biggest benefit of something like this is getting that kind of wide angle view of, um, really, really important topics. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I might have been a bit fast on my time allotment, but that's, uh, you know, happy to take any okay. questions as we discuss <laughs> and uh, yeah, pass it along. Yeah. So did I hear you right when you say this is this is this is a first for your first collaboration or is this your first collaboration of its kind? So is it your first collaboration in general? Um, I mean, I've worked on like, individual stories with other people before, but the first time it's been like an official uh, organized collaboration like this. Okay. All right. We'll circle back on that as well, because I think there's a there's I know it's running in, in the minds of a lot of journalists in Indonesia who's never done any collaboration before. And you might have some insights for them as well. Thank you, Mike. And from Vietnam, we'll come back to Indonesia, where we will hear for, uh, from Viria, from Pro, uh, Project Multatuli, his, who's actually perhaps we're taking a, him away from his time, wrapping his story up in Project Multatuli for the for the for the collaboration. Um, Virya, um, over to you. Thanks, Lou. Uh, I hope my I hope you can clear me. You can hear me clearly. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Virya Singhi. I'm a reporter at Project Multatuli. Project Multatuli is a new media outlet in Indonesia where, that was just launched in May 2021. Uh, we're a collective. We're dedicated to to carrying out the ideals of public journalism by giving a voice to the voiceless and reporting the underreported. And we focus on publishing uh, long form narratives. So uh, when talking about Indonesia's energy sector, maybe I'm just going to open this with uh, by saying that the sector is just full of broken promises and lip service. Uh, Indonesia has had various ambitious goals in the past seven years during the President Joko Widodo era uh, to boost the use of renewable energy. Yet, yet there, there has been no significant progress on the ground. Uh, and at the end of the day, Indonesia has always gone back to coal. <clears throat> and while some of the promises are like uh, Indonesia established a target to increase the share of renewable energy in the national energy mix, from a mere 10% in 2015 to 23% in 2025. Uh, to Indonesia wants to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 29% uh, by 2030. Or recently, Indonesia also said, uh, Indonesia also submitted its updated climate commitments to the UN and set a deadline to uh, 
to eliminate completely the greenhouse gas emissions by 2060 or before. But for me, who has been covering this issue for some time here in Indonesia, it's just full of nonsense. Uh, the reality is, as of 2020, uh, renewable energy share in the national energy mix only stood at 11.2 percent uh, in Indonesia, while coal share still stood at uh, 38 percent. It's still far away uh, from the 20, 23 percent renewable energy share target slated for 2025. Uh, and the capacity of renewable power plants uh, in Indonesia only reached 10.4 gigawatt last year, uh, while the capacity of coal-fired facilities was at about 36.7 gigawatt. So officials have repeatedly reaffirmed their, their commitment to achieve Indonesia's renewable energy goals, despite facts saying otherwise. So. Uh, in the beginning of this project with EGN, I proposed some story ideas. Uh, the first one, uh, I, I wanted to, to write an in-depth analytical report on how and why Indonesia's renewable energy so sector is not going anywhere. Uh, the report details the main challenges in the sector, whether the, the oversupply of electricity uh, because of the incorrect economic assumptions, financial burden of the a state utility PLN uh, and attractive renewable energy policies that make renewable projects unbankable and many others. Uh, while the first story, uh, that story is more of a macro report on Indonesia's energy sector, uh, the second idea is uh, in the second idea, I want to go hyper local by highlighting uh, the lives of people in Morain Emergency in South Sumatra. Uh, I want to focus on the human side of it. Uh, why Morain in South Sumatra? Because the region has long been touted as one of Indonesia's energy barns because of its huge coal resources and reserves. And it's also the headquarters of state coal miner PT Bukit Asam. Uh, I want to highlight the social health and environmental impacts of intense coal mining activities and power plants in, in Morainim. And uh, the coverage the coverage there will also result in a short film. Then the last idea uh, is to create a data story that maps out coal mines and oligarchs in, in Indonesia. Uh, this, this data story will try to answer several questions why who are the conglomerates that control the biggest coal businesses in indonesia who are political figures that benefit from coal why is it so hard for indonesia to quit coal uh the progress is uh yeah as sam told us before the the project was uh expected to to complete in october but uh but now we have just published two reports the first one is uh, an in-depth analytical report on the energy sector uh, and the second one the long-form feature on the lives of people in Morainim. a short film uh, is expected to be published tomorrow and the data story is set to be published in mid-january uh, next year uh yeah there are some delays because uh, there have been some ex unexpected challenges as well as i told you that project multatul is a new news out new news outlet with a small team of reporters and editors hence a reporter or editor often has to juggle two or three projects at once and also unexpectedly in the first week of october uh, Project Multatuli got DDoS attacks that brought down our website. Uh, the, this digital attack came hours after we published our report uh, on alleged 
police inaction in a South Sulawesi rape case involving three young children. And so we were forced to temporarily stop our project and, and focus on this problem. And other problems include uh, restricted movement during the pandemic. We must carefully uh, plan our coverage before going to the field and doing reporting as efficient as possible. Uh, it takes longer than expected to, make, to map out coal oligarchs in the country, whether because of their complicated business structure or lack of transparency. Some lessons learned. Mm, yeah, I think adaptability is, is key in facing off the, the obstacles in the process. Uh, and for, for a project Mulatuli, yeah, a, a bigger team is needed to simultaneously work on long projects in the pipeline. Uh, but this is a very interesting project. To be honest, it's kind of it's kind of exhausting, but it's also gratifying. Uh, I think it gives an opportunity for for all parties involved to work together to fight for a cleaner world, to prepare for a better world for our future generation. So, yeah. Back to you, Flo. All right, uh, Viria, thank you. Yes, I understand you have to go through hours and hours of transcript. Uh, uh, following your interview in, in South Sumatra. All right, now um, I'm gonna, I have a set of, I have, I have a couple of questions for the speakers myself, but I also encourage uh, the participants here to ask away um, the speakers today, if you would like to, and we, I encourage you to ask uh, the questions directly, please raise your hand, uh, use the raise hand function and we will allow you and we'll unmute you and ask you uh, the question. But um, so I, I'd like to go back to Sam a little bit. Sam, you're working with the, in this project and maybe also in your previous um, collaboration that you work with. Obviously you, you work with uh, a, a, a very diverse team, uh, not just individuals, but the media themselves with varying uh, capacity and experience and so then, um, and, and would, did, that, did that call for different kind of approaches as well for you to be able to level things up and bring everybody um, on the table or at least your own table to make sure that you, it's, uh, the project and collaboration itself is, is manageable? I mean, Lulu, for instance, is, uh, uh, she's more uh, experienced in collaboration, for instance. And Mike, who, who is his, jumping with both feet, but he's also new here. And also Viria coming from a smaller media compared to the other media that you work with. So uh, if you could share a little bit about, about um, how, how you approach uh, that diversity in order to make things work. Thanks, Flo. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a, it's, I think it, it goes to the heart of um, doing these collaborative projects, especially in the case of EJN, which Again, we're not ICIJ. We're, you know, we're not um, urban papers. We don't have limitless resources um, to convene um, our participants, our collaborators, to, you know, hire uh, a retinue of um, IT folks and and you know specialists to wrangle data and get sort of a, a bunch of material in place that then everybody can pick through and sort through. And so at the end of the day, it's incumbent upon the editor, in, in this case, myself and the uh, folks I'm very fortunate to work with, including Flo and, and uh, many members of the EJ and team, to really identify what, um, what are the methods to work with our, with our different partners. And as I mentioned before, you know, uh, the collaborators in this project span the absolute extremes in terms of what their demands are. So Vidya just spoke, um, he has a very innovative outlet. He works for a very innovative um, public journalism outlet um, that much like Lulu's um, is focused on long form uh, narrative pieces that are in depth, heavily reported, investigative, have um, you know, very uh, substantial infographics and photos, and uh, you know, and 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 really um, go to the fullest extent to tell their pieces. And then on the other extreme, we're working with dailies in the in the case of 
the Philippine Daily Inquirer, it is a daily newspaper that has the demands of a daily, right? To produce stories that are not necessarily nearly as rich um, um, and in depth, but are of course useful, right? And, and necessary for their audiences. And so the balance I think becomes one in which um, you identify what the uh, constraints are of each different outlet, of each different collaborator, and try to bring those to, to bear as an editor. In the event, so, so the way that, just sort of to step back for a second, um, EJN is not a news outlet in so far that we publish original content. We republish, we repost stories that appear in the outlets that we fund. In, in this case, a special project <clears throat> was um, an effort in which we funded um, several different outlets under the context of a specific um, theme, right? And they were outlets, not journalists. Traditionally, we have primarily worked with funding, funding um, individual journalists and not the outlets. So you can see how there's a difference, right? There's a difference of scope in, in, in those two uh, cases. And so in working a collaborative process in which you're working with outlets as opposed to individual journalists, um, it's a very different, it's a different modality, right? It's, it's, a, it's a totally different animal. Um, and so what happens in that case is that you're in many cases, you're working with editors and in, in, in the event, in the case of Lewis, she's an editor as well as being uh, a journalist. Um, Michael is an editor as well as being a journalist. NVIDIA has editorial experience and, and serves in a hybrid capacity in, in multiple from what I understand. And so um, I think they are just inherently more able to understand the complexities and the necessities of piecing together the interests of each different party. Um, and so um, if I was working, if a hypothetical were to be like, I was working with journalists from, um, you know, a very large outlet and, uh, and not with editors, but piecing together a collaborative project, I don't think it necessarily would work so well because hmm. depending on the journalists, of course, um, because a lot of those folks don't necessarily have a sense of um, the editorial structure of their entire outlet, of the financial constraints, of um, you know, all the other constraints that just govern how you operate a, a media house or a, a, an outlet. And so nonprofit or for profit. Right. And so and so I think I, I think it's it's just it's it's really I, I think the 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 ability to connect um, with outlets that have folks that know understand both sides of the equation, and um, and it's, it's an art. It's not a science. It's the art of communication and piecing together um, sort of different styles, different personalities, and different sort of cultures, as I mentioned before. Right, right. Thank you, Sam. So, um, and we we'll move to a question on. Uh, from a participant. This is from Ethan Koka, whom I think, uh, thank you for, for dropping by, Nathan. But this question is for Lulu, but um, others, I think it applies to others as well, because you, uh, somewhere in your story there, uh, there's a lot of involvement uh, in, in China mentioned. Is it getting more challenging to report in China itself? And considering it's important in so many environment or energy stories in Asia, what is the impact of the increasingly challenging environment uh, for journalism? And does this impact the ability for Chinese outlets or reporters to collaborate? Maybe you can, you can, you can kick that, uh, that off, uh, Lulu? Yes, hi, um, thanks for the question. Um, um, I think the short answer is uh, yes, it's getting more difficult and it has an impact in how a lot of Chinese outlets and media is able to or is willing to is potentially, um, yeah, able to work with a lot of these more uh, international projects. But the longer answer is, I think, um, I'm gonna make it concrete. For instance, these collaborations with uh, EJN and uh, the stories are originally published in Chinese in initium, um, but with the uh, Sam and I together, 
trying to uh, translate and edit through a very long form uh, Chinese uh, features into English, it was then republished in another language. I think it also offered the journalist some level of uh, imaginations. It is how your work could be read and seen by a different perspective. I think it also, it, uh, at least the journalist I work with on this project, she was very, um, happy and really excited to see that her work is, is, is reaching out to a very different set of audience. Um, having said that, it is getting more difficult as opposed to attract more uh, journalists to come to this type of reporting and to um, allow it to happen. Um, and to create a kind of strategy that would work um, facing the elephant in the room that is the more difficult uh, media landscape from inside China. I think that that, it, that is like the space. Uh, I think there's still chances. I, I'm still reached by uh, younger younger journalists or journalism students asking, "What is this type of things you do? Why is it so different from the traditional um, international news concept?" Because uh, if you are a aspiring Chinese journalist, you see big outlet, for instance, you see their foreign correspondents in China now are a lot are not in China anymore, but you see this one way of doing international news. But um, I think the, the interest and the questions about, hey, what is this kind of more collaborative approach? What, how is it possible that we can do it also? I think there's still interest there. Um, it's really about pushing you through one case after another, one person after another. I think that's my... Uh, very quick take. All right, uh, Mike or Viria, would you like to add that? And in terms, in relation to your work on reporting stories that has um, China context, Chinese investment um, in respective countries. Uh, sure. I mean, I that does come in a bit, or not more than a bit, when you're talking about thermal uh, coal, specifically investment in Vietnam. A lot of Chinese banks are kind of the last. Uh, Bank of Last Resort currently for thermal projects here, which is something I've also previously um, reported on. And a little similar to, as I talked about in my presentation or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, you're not going to get any official line on that um, or you won't be able to contact. I mean, I, I tried to contact a couple of Chinese companies for that story. Didn't go anywhere. Um, but I think like Lulu said, you kind of have to work around knowing that those obstacles will be there and find who you can to talk about. And, and it's unfortunate because, you know, as a journalist, you want to try to get uh, as much balance as you can. Or I mean, even if it's something contentious like thermal power, uh, where we know coal is definitively bad for the environment, um, you do want to try to get as many voices as you can. And when you simply can't access those voices, that does get frustrating. But it, yeah, it's something you you know, kind of always know in the back of your mind and work around. Right. Julia, did you want to add something? I think Lulu and Mike uh, have said it all, that yeah, I agree with Mike. Uh, reaching out to Chinese companies, like it's, it's like going to a black hole, I think. So it's challenging. But yeah, and while I have you, um, Virya, here's a question from Agus in Tanahgayo. Dot com. I think this is a meet an online media uh, from from Aceh, uh, North Sumatra. Uh, does Indonesia has what it takes in in this case the financial support resources to for to to uh, build its renewables and green economy? And uh, this is a question for maybe um, for all of the other uh, panelists. A second question: whether in whether whether the Earth will survive climate change without the, the intervention uh, of Chinese, China, Russia, and the US? Very interesting question. <laughs> Go ahead, Virya, maybe you can ask the first yeah, question. Uh, first sorry, question, you answered the first question. First question, does Indonesia have the money? We do have the money, we do have the resources. We always boast about our abundant natural resources. Uh, but there's no political will, uh, lack of competence, and it's not just about the money, of course. Uh, it's about the competence and the careful planning because uh, as what I 
have elaborated in one of my stories uh, since uh, President Jokowi's first term, he has announced and and kick off several ambitious projects. He wanted to boost economic growth. He and subsequently, uh, he expects the electricity electricity cons- consumption will will rise, and then that's why he launched the thirty five gigawatt electricity procurement program, but. It's like the House of Courts, uh, economic growth uh, fell short, uh, it's not as high as, as expected. Then there's an oversupply of electricity and now the, the state electricity firm PLN must bear the financial burden of uh, because it is responsible for overseeing the construction of so many power projects and so many of them are coal based uh, and many of them have reached financial closure or are in construction phase so it's kind of impossible to stop it now despite the fact that we are facing a huge oversupply of electricity so the point is it needs uh, yeah, competence and careful planning. And Joko Widodo has a track record of being fickle and, and, and impulsive. Uh, when he wants this, then the ministers have to do this. When he wants that, the ministers have to do that. And such a rapid, ex- rapid planning and execution Seems, seems, seems nice in general public, but not in long term. Right. Um, and do you want to kick off the second question? Um, anybody wants to weigh in on that question? I have another question that's coming up here about your recommendation on collaboration. But um, anyone so wants to can, you just, can, can you repeat the question again? Come again? Can you repeat the question again? Oh, the second question for everyone. Uh, uh, without, uh, without China, Russia, and the US, do you think the Earth has a chance against climate change? No. Well, <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> I appreciate so, your honesty I, and directness, I, Sam. It's so blatant, but no, the answer is no. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, in, in, in no way whatsoever. Is, is that and I guess, I mean, this is connected to his third, second question. I guess then uh, how, how can collaboration, uh, how do you think collaboration can improve? I mean, in, obviously we, we, the media the collaboration with news, uh, collaboration, collaboration between new sector and non new sector alone will not be able to stop what's happening right now. But how can we improve? How can we, we, we get everybody to move towards into that direction, you know, uh, through collaboration, I guess. How can we Im- improve the state of collaboration and make it better, make sure that uh, we're, we, we don't have such pessimism or uh, uh, instead of having no, we can, you know, maybe move towards maybe, yes, if, so. Well, I, um, so yeah. Go ahead, Lulu. Go ahead, Lulu. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Maybe I want to add one line there. I think it is um, often quite depressing, you know, indeed, if we talk about, and also are interesting in many ways when we talk about climate change and energy uh, policies, that uh, countries become a name, like becomes China, US, uh, Russia, as if that's the that's the host, that's like the decision maker, the power, the, 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 the fate. But it's not. These are not. They're not real. There's no such thing as China. It, it, it's it's a, such a um, abstract and over uh, overly emphasized um, um, uh, concept in a way. It is f- people there, and it's uh, a lot more individuals than this word China um, entails. And I think if anything, from a journalism perspective, that we could add to the narrative is probably to try our best to allow people to see that it's not. Uh, there's no one China, there's no one decision, and there's no one um, 
overpowering kind of like uh, process. You know what I mean? Like if we can bring in the understanding of also how um, Chinese people are affected and how their life and their expectation and their understanding of the world um, is also part of the story. I think that's uh, what journalism is as a profession, as a sector could contribute there. And the collaboration definitely is a very interesting tool to use a mindset to have so that we don't sit on different sides of the table um, pointing fingers and saying, uh, you're responsible, you're responsible, you're responsible, but to understand that we're all here. We all as here as individuals. I mean, Sam, we have seen stories that have made, that have, have there are impactful, made changes, change, uh, uh, sway policy and behavioral change, right? Yeah, maybe I misunderstood the, maybe I misunderstood, misunderstood the question as, as, as I understand it was originally written in Indonesian. I'm, I'm sure it was probably written with more nuance. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I absolutely concur with Lulu. I, I didn't mean to sound so desultory. I mean, absolutely. I think it's, it is the case that uh, this project, I think, is a small example in which there is an attempt to show how there are multiple actors and stakeholders involved at every different level throughout mm -hmm. the region. Um, in the case of China, and as Lulu pointed out, there's this sort of monolithic idea that um, all China has this um, ability to uh, either quash or achieve uh, climate emissions goals. And as the stories by Nishim um, have shown quite um, uh, clearly, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and the energy needs domestically within China, uh, the interest um, within China and its and its uh, international partners, its regional partners, are much more complicated than I think, uh, at least in Western media, is is portrayed. So I, I didn't mean to sound too glib about that. I do think there is mm -hmm. a lot more nuance than than um, is often portrayed. Um, I, I think what I was rather trying to just point out is that those three specific countries, in terms of their emissions, right. Um, and their control of fossil fuels um, do control the fate of much of the planet. Um, and um, with a few small exceptions, there's very little leverage upon those three nations that were mentioned in terms of them being able to uh, change their policies related to, to fossil fuel emissions, uh, excuse me, to uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, emanating from fossil fuels. So in, in that way, I think I think that that is like the over overarching um, sense, but absolutely, I, I agree with, with Lou and, and any of the other folks in the room who would point out that this is a contested space. This is absolutely a contested space, whether we're talking about Indonesia, as many of the stories in our project have pointed out. Um, it was mentioned, uh, Mike mentioned Sulky's uh, story about South Korea investment, which actually also tied into Vietnam and um, a coal-fired power plant in Indonesia and in Vietnam, and how those are contested spaces, and how um, sort of the disparities between how domestic ideas about eliminating emissions in South Korea versus what their overseas um, patterns are. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, uh, ways of looking at this beyond sort of the conventional narrative. So I, I would absolutely agree that um, journalism has a role of pointing out these divergencies, these, the, mm -hmm. the nuances, the complexities that um, that are often just sort of glossed over, right? Because you think, mm -hmm. oh, China is this way, the US is this way, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, it's, it's, ne it's never like that, right? There's so many stakeholders involved. Right. Mike, did you, did you wanna say something earlier or? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, uh, I mean, I agree, obviously climate change is a huge topic to wrap your head around. It's complicated, even if you read about it every day. Um, but I think a collaboration like this, I think that's kind of what somebody was talking about, but it certainly helps to, again, like get a big picture. And I mean, also getting, you know, journalists or people like we, there is competition in our industry and like there's definitely can be some, you know, Maybe not so much in climate coverage, but some, you know, there can be a bit of a race to get a story first, or oh, I don't want somebody else covering this while I'm working on it. Um, which, of course, if you've got a huge story, uh, understandable. Um, when it's something like this that is such a 
you know, a deep, we'll have a, you know, such an impact on all of humanity for the rest of our lives. Um, I think a collaborative project, kind of getting rid of that competition certainly helps. Um, uh, and also, you know, gives readers, if, if something is published like across platforms, if, if a reader sees something on one website or publication and is like, oh, I don't really trust that because it's from country X or whatever company, if they see it somewhere else, then maybe they would uh, be like, oh, uh, that's also on this website that I like to read. Maybe I should take it more seriously. Um, and then again, I'll bring up Sulky's story because that's what I'm <laughs> most familiar with other than my own. Like I, I saw that she also worked with a, a reporter in Vietnam and I think Indonesia as well. Um, so really good to have like people on the ground across multiple countries um, where I know Sam's intro, you talk, you know, there's a mention of parachute journalism, which is actually kind of impossible right now uh, because of COVID restrictions in a lot of countries, which I have seen some coverage that like, this is good because local journalists can get more involved. Um, and that's certainly important. So I think all of those, I don't know if I'm getting off topic here, but all of those are certainly benefits of a collaboration like this. Right. So, and here's a, uh, here's uh, an, another question uh, that, that you can talk about when you talk about uh, collaboration and environmental reporting. Uh, what would be your recommendation for journalists and media, especially this, especially for for in, in, in Indonesia, to to push them to be to be to get more focused uh, towards conservation, uh, ocean conservation, forest conservation in uh, massive in, in, in islands like Papua, uh, Sumatra, and Kalimantan. If you have a recommendation or uh, thoughts um, on that. I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry, Flo. Could you? Uh, how, what, will you what will be your recommendation for media and journalists to uh, move towards uh, more collaborative reporting? covering issues like uh, the environment, not just environment in general, but more specifically on conservation, uh, ocean conservation, um, forest conservation. Um, I think uh, he, he, he's focusing on islands like Papua, Sumatra, and Kalimantan, but I think it applies, in, it applies everywhere globally. I have some ideas, but I, I've spoken a lot, so I'm, I'm willing to wait if others want to. Vidya has spoken a lot. Viria, did you want to answer? Did you want to start start that answering that? Yeah, it's kind of complicated. Uh, well, this 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 dirty energy issue, this environmental issue, uh, most of the time, it's just the topic for the rich, uh, for the middle class. Uh, with Starbucks on his or her right hand, talking about the environment, how we can change the world, how, what should we do? But, but, well, for those uh, who, are, who are still living under under the poverty line, it's not something that will immediately get you, if you know what I mean. I don't know. Uh, and I think that's the big homework: how to to mainstream this issue, how to to make people more emotionally invested in this. I think uh, that's the answer. That I cannot answer that by myself. And. I think that's why we need collaboration to answer that question together. Mm -hmm. Sam? Well, yeah, so I, I really appreciate that video really talking about adding class to this discussion because I think it does really bleed into uh, the public journalism component, which is the readership, the viewership, your audience, um, how much of the material is actually relatable to to um, large segments of the population. Um, and that's something I need to think about in greater detail. But what I was gonna say to the earlier point um, with regards to collaboration on this type of material, it's something that I've given some thought to um, as I've at EJ and I've also been responsible for putting together a, a course for journalists. And here's an, a, a shameless plug. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, a course for journalists on biodiversity. So how, 
journalists across the world, primarily in the global south, um, can cover biodiversity and use biodiversity as a pig um, mm -hmm. or as multiple angles in the reporting. And within that context, what I really realized in developing this course and looking at this material is that there are so many different uh, ways that you can approach something like forest conservation in Kalimantan or, or Sumatra um, that are beyond the conventional narratives of, um, in Indonesia, it's often, you know, palm oil uh, is leading to deforestation um, and um, peat fires. And this is, you know, this is, um, this, you know, there's, there's not really sort of multidimensional looks at livelihoods, at the folks that are involved in um, those different components, as, as Fidia spoke to this question of class, um, who is involved in, in aspects of deforestation, what are their motives, why, um, and then building different types of stories based on a question, in our case, in the fossil fuel project, it was that simple question that I showed on my slide, um, it could be a, uh, a data set. It could be something like that, just a question that you, you build on, but covering all the different dimensions of it, you know, not just deforestation as deforestation sake, just looking at it as a criminal act, and uh, it's, which is, is obviously very important, right? From an investigative mm -hmm. standpoint, to look at why deforestation happens and why it continues unabated, et cetera, et cetera. But what are the, you know, what are the different, uh, components of it, what are the different consequences of it, and different outlets, and from that, I think, can stem the different type of outlets that can be involved, and I really approach this from the standpoint of, you know, from a collaborative framework, um, you can really include any number of outlets, whether it's a lifestyle uh, uh, media focus, um, whether it's something that's focused on the political economy, whether it's something that's focused on breaking news, um, whether it's something that's focused purely on business news, something that's focused purely on environmental framework, adding this together um, and, and, and the art of it, I think fundamentally is to find the question that will unify those different interests. And so to, the, to, to speak to your, uh, the person who asked that question, I think um, if this individual is really interested in developing a collaborative pursuit focused around Sumatra and Kalimantan and, and, and the like, they really should um, sort of find a question that can unify these forces. And of course, obviously funding is an issue as well, but, but um, find something and, and, and be, be open to the possibility that there might be different perspectives and unify those perspectives in, in your piece. And I'll just give one before I, be, before I end on this note. Um, one note that I think is, is relevant to this. We had lots of stories within the fossil fuel project that pertain to natural gas. Mm -hmm. And many of many of the, the participants in this this conference may know that, of course, natural gas in its extraction is actually uh, doesn't emit nearly as many um, uh, greenhouse uh, gases, right? And and and, and, and uh, damaging greenhouse gases as carbon dioxide because um, it's just the extraction. It's uh, excuse me, the the burning of, of uh, natural gas. It's the extraction of it that produces methane. Um, there were all sorts of different perspectives on. The, uh, the damaging effects of methane in, in many of these stories. And I, as an editor, had to really sort of unify that to say, well, the science behind methane is, is fairly clear in this regard, but to say that, you know, methane in, in certain contexts, like natural gas is bad. I mean, it's certainly not a bridge fuel as it's, as it's advertised across the world, but it's less bad in certain contexts as compared to others. You know, and so I think I, I, my my point being that I added in outlets and um, um, and perspectives that didn't necessarily always mesh together, but the idea was that there is nuance, there is complexity to this discussion, and it's important to add a, a variety of perspectives as much as possible while still keeping the science and the facts um, uh, at the cord. And, and that's hard to do. That's the editor's job. That's really hard to do. But that's that's something that I think maybe to the to the questioner's um, point, maybe this can be done. But it really it really is incumbent upon you to hone in and refine either your question or the data set that your everyone from the collaborative project is focused on.
Right. You beat me to to it, to that, uh, Sam. But uh, before we, I think we have time for one more question here. I think it's it's it's, it's an interesting question from Erti um, uh, to Sam and Lou and, and, and uh, of course, uh, Virya and Mike as well. Uh, concerning, uh, she noticed, she said that there's, she, there's an impression that there's a lot of uh, this framing that a lot of env environmental journalists um, are writing about uh, how developing nations are contributing to climate change. Um, and, and there's not a lot of framing uh, when in fact uh, that there is there's a lot of contribution from uh, developed countries, uh, first world countries to, you know, through their consumption of coal, the plastic waste uh, that are just as if not more responsible uh, to the environmental damage that we're seeing now in climate change. So her question is that, did you, do you think there's a, there's, there's some kind of political play in making sure that this is the framing that's coming out? I mean, I think it's important for journalists to be able to have the space to answer these questions because uh, if that's what you see, well, that's what you, what's happening right now. Should we, should we be seeing more or should we be covering more about um, how um, develop, developed countries are just as responsible for climate change? Sam and Lulu, these questions are. Lulu, do you want to take it first? I, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm I'm, I'm willing to follow you. Um. Yeah, no, it's a very, very good question, and I agree with uh, Flo that uh, uh, journalists should be able to um, maybe not reflect on every piece of things we write, but definitely think about these questions um, uh, uh, while we write it. Uh, how do I? How, my um. My immediate thoughts, this is a very complicated question and I, really this is probably um, a million dollar. Um, but my initial thought is how interesting that um, multiple narratives, um, um, very complicated uh, stories and framings um, sort of come together to, a, to, to each of our audience or us as journalists um, and become this one big thing. Um, uh, because uh, obviously, so if you're talking about a, a journalist's role, a lot of journalists are looking at the one project, right? One problem. That is this very specific problem that needs addressing. And then that there's nothing, I don't think uh, necessarily there's a very strong political uh, choice or it's a strategy or anything. It's just like by nature, journalists are drawn to problems and then we want to, write about how the problems are occurred and who can do better. It is um, uh, often the case. Um, but then how uh, uh, choices of uh, thousands of thousands of stories and come together uh, uh, form a frame that uh, becomes uh, uh, this question. I think that's, um, how do I put it? Yes, um, I think there should be a lot more um, uh, stories coming out from, for instance, the idea of uh, uh, a uh, supply chain um, situation where you look at how one decision, one production is never, it doesn't end at any given spot. It's, it's such a uh, globalized situation we're looking at that we should uh, look at who is responsible at different stage of, uh, um, of any, any, any kind of product, any of kind of uses of resources. This is where we are now, right? 2021 after, um, after the, the, the world economy just works that way. I think it's, it's, it's super interesting. It's not necessarily more of a developed versus developing situation. It's just how uh, a complicated, complicated connected world we're living in. And, and that, that's definitely somewhere I think journalists probably have less, um, it's too difficult to tell such a global story, right? We tend to look at the more specifics, um, but, but if, if indeed there will be more um, collaborations, for instance, that we're, we're linking these um, far apart places, then maybe that will create a different layer of narrative that in the end will um, give um, our audience and ourselves more things to think about. All right, Sam, uh, very quickly, if you want to add on to that. Yeah, no, I, I, very well put, Lulu. I, I think that's exactly right. I think, I, you know, in, in the event of this particular project, um, just so to assuage the questioner's concerns, the, the interest of this project 
was to focus on Asia as a whole because that was the ambit of the project. Um, and um, indeed, there's quite a bit of journalism about the role of developed countries in the global north um, and its role of consumption and its emissions patterns. And I don't think that's debatable. There's, there's a huge amount of responsibility and culpability on the mm -hmm. part of global, on the global north, perhaps the greatest responsibility and culpability. So I don't think that that um, is being shirked away from by uh, many media outlets. Um, I think in our particular case for this project, the interest was to focus on stories that are untold or mm. stories that are lesser told. And I think that that was that was why the focus um, was on this. Um, but it is not to say um, that one should ignore the roles and responsibilities of um, global powers that are not included within, like I said, the ambit of this particular project. So um, that, that that's what I would say about that. There is no uh, ax to grind or interest on the part of EJN in this in this particular capacity, except that we had a regional focus on, on Asia. Um, and uh, I would strongly urge the questioner to, to look at the large, vast array of stories about um, the roles, the responsibilities, and the culpability of, of the global north and its and the current crisis that we're that we're facing. Right. Okay. Guys, we're really at the top of the hour. I do have one last question for all the journalists um, who are listening, uh, so they, they have they have more uh, to take away from this discussion. Um, uh, one last question for everyone. We'll start with Sam, Lulu, and then Mike and Viria. For for any uh, journalists and media or editor who's list, who's in in the room right now, if they were to want to, want to start uh, a collaboration. What are the three things they want to prioritize? before they start put their thinking cap on and, and what are the three things you recommend for them to focus on? I say three because uh, uh, we'll just press for time. So I'm sure there, there's a long list of <laughs> what they need to look into, but. I'm just gonna start real quickly so I can just get, get off the bat. Um, first, you have to ask the question, what is the question of the you know, why do you need to do a collaboration? What is what is the reason for doing a collaboration? Second would be what is uh, the motivation for this collaboration, whether it's a data set as in the case of the Pandora Papers or the Panama Project or, or, or the Pegasus Panama Papers or, or uh, Pegasus Project, or if it's a question, a motivating question like we had in the Fossil Fuel Project. And three, who, what are the bare minimum number of collaborators that you need to achieve that? So those are three questions that I would say. Thank you, Sam. Lulu? Um, I like a number three. Um, okay, I think the first is I would um, recommend build meaningful connection and communication uh, with uh, uh, the potential partner partnering freelancing journalist or partnering uh, media outlet out there. I think the most interesting set of databases is our mind. And then if we are sharing and more open, more critical and understanding in that communication, it's going to bring you um, bring, bring our collaboration uh, a lot of fruit in there. So that and the second is related is taking take a leap of faith um i think a lot of our collaboration happens without us like none of us meet each other in person we are not best friends offline but we we we, we have um at some level of understanding that it will work we will trust each other and we'll put up our best um capacity in doing something like that and that's uh yeah that's i think it will be a decision to not hold back as like see how things will happen in a more beautiful way but actually giving everything in so that it's possible to to be fruitful and i would say the third uh it's very relevant to me is always think uh in different perspectives how your audience might be uh, essentially very different set of uh, um, people from uh, the audience that you uh, of the journalist or the actor you work from another reaching another country and that uh, different perspectives are uh, as much as opportunities opportunities as well as challenges and i think that that's that's where uh, i think everyone in the media sector should be aware of when a collaboration starts and really the decision to be open and to be critical is so interesting because it's going to bring in not just 
um, project itself, but also a more deepening understanding of the um, uh, problems at hand. And it will lead to new stories, basically, practically. Thank you, Lou. Mike? Um, yeah, I'll just quick, I mean, all really good points. I'll just quickly add, I mean, this would kind of be done before you consider starting a collaboration, but um, network as best you can. I mean, online, like Lulu said, like, obviously we're not all going to be meeting in person, um, maybe ever or you know, for a long time at least. Um, but I, for me uh, personally, like, I found Twitter as problematic as it is. And of course it has huge problems related to it, but it's been pretty indispensable in terms of connecting with other journalists, editors, uh, sources, both here in Vietnam and in other countries around the region and, and around the world. Um, so it, it, may, it may sound strange, but if you're not on Twitter, I, I do re really recommend that. It's a good way to, to meet other people. Again, not in person, but you never know. There's been times where I've been, I've gotten a new topic and been like, oh, who do I follow in Myanmar? Uh, message them. And sometimes that can turn into really useful information or you know, a, a digital friendship at the very least. Um, so yeah, network. And I mean, outside of Twitter, you know, there's Telegram uh, groups, there's, I mean, Slack is like invite only, but maybe there's Slack groups around. Um, so yeah, I would say just try to connect with people online um, as much as possible, particularly, you know, uh, within your own country, of course, but also elsewhere, either in the region or, or around the world. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, Viria. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the most important thing is to last question as as what Sam said. Uh, my one of my editors always told me when I want to do a project, when I want to write something or when I want to collaborate with others, uh, so what? Uh, what 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 do you want to achieve through this? And the second one be open, the third one be adapted. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope this has been useful for, for, for all of us, the participants um, especially. Um, you are able to find all of the speakers on Twitter for sure. Um, um, I think you can connect with them. You can also connect with the EJN on our journalism.net and find out what we do and, 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 and the programs that we're currently uh, activities that we're currently carrying out. So um, on that note, thank you so much, Sam, Lulu, Mike, and Viria for your insights. Um, I hope that has been useful. Let's, let's connect, let's network, and let's, let's think of a future collaboration that we can all get our hands on. Thank you. I'll hand over um, to Nana. Okay, thank you, Florence, Sam, uh, Viria, Lulu, and Michael for such an insight, insightful session. And also thank you uh, to all the participants who have joined from every corner of the world, wherever you are. But before we end our sessions, uh, let's have take, uh, let's just have a quick picture, shall we? You can uh, you can turn on your camera if you want, and I'll have my colleague uh, Lina Melina from PPMN to take a quick picture. And again. Yes, can somebody take some picture? Okay. Okay. All right then, so. <laughs> well, I would like to once again, thank you to uh, all the people who have been participated. Uh, please find the feedback form in the chat box. We highly appreciate it if you can uh, give your feedback about the event and give a confirmation if you need a, an e-certificate to be issued for you. Uh, and I really hope uh, to see you again someday and maybe uh, meet all of you in person. So once again, thank you so much and goodbye.